So uh, the first thing I want to do is sort of write down again uh, the example that we talked about yesterday a little bit. I think I promised you guys that I would I would have colored chalk this time. So we talked about f of z is equal to z squared. And I think we had chosen a point z naught is equal to 1 plus 1 i. And we were thinking about what f does to 1 plus 1 i and curves that pass through it. Um, so the map of 1 plus 1 i was the point 0 plus 2 i. We have, I think, this curve, which was gamma of t uh, was equal to, what are we, t, no, we're moving in the x variable, yeah, so t plus 1i was our curve in this direction, and then the image of that, so f of gamma of t, okay, I'm going to guess, this was, was it? One minus one quarter of y. The image here, which I'll write in white after we did the elimination of parameters, turned into something like x is equal to one minus one quarter of a y squared, or was it a two? That's right. One quarter y squared minus one. Okay, we got one no, wrong way. One quarter of y squared minus one. So that was the parabola that opened in this direction. And then we looked at this curve. And this curve uh, turned into a parabola that opened in this direction. So this was uh, x is equal to 1 minus 1 quarter of a y squared. And then we made the observation uh, that what ended up happening, this angle was right. And that this angle, if you calculate the derivatives, remains right. And if you should be able to see here that it looks like this rotation is a 45 degree rotation. So if you actually took the derivative vectors to this curve at this point, you would get a little frame, which would look like this. And that frame is preserved in, not in the curve, but in the tangent to the curves, because straight lines didn't map to straight lines here. But the frame of the derivatives was rotated there. Um, and it looks to me like that angle was 45 degrees based on the um, observation that we made at the end, that predict that rotation should have been predicted by the derivative. Uh, f of z is equal to z squared. f prime of z is equal to 2z. We made the observation that whatever number came out of this derivative at z naught, so at the point 1 plus 1i, is probably easier to write as f prime of root 2 e to the i, i over 4 which is 2 root 2 e to the i pi over 4. This is the rotation factor of the frame. The derivative controlled that. So this is the theta rotation. And then I have to do a better job of drawing what happened to the frame, because the frame actually ends up being stretched. But both vectors are stretched by a factor of 2 root 2. So there's a rotation and a stretch here. So this was the r that was the rotation. And that was independent of the curves that we chose. It applied to both of them. And this basic geometric structure is what we meant by a conformal map. Okay, so that was kind of the, the upshot of last time. The first exercise I'm going to have you guys do is going to be draw a square over here and track the image of the square, including figuring where the interior goes. Okay, so are there questions about this? This is sort of a recap of last time. Questions about what we're doing here? Okay. All right. So when we left off last time, we'd gotten to the point where we were going to talk about, uh, I mentioned that uh, this works at points where the derivative is not zero. Because if the derivative was zero, you sort of destroy any information you can extract about the frame, right? If I have a zero here, I don't know if there's a rotation or if there's not. If it's consistent. I don't know if it's preserved. I have no idea what the stretch factor is. So at the point z is equal to 0, we saw that we got this weird behavior where this line was taken to just the right half line, and that this line 
was taken to the left half line. So here, through the point z is equal to zero, we started with the right angle. No, my fancy chalk. Needs a Viking funeral. Okay, so we have made the observation here that even though we started with the right angle, we ended up with something that looked like an angle of pi. So this was pi over 2, and this is pi. So the function fails to be conformal at that point. And the reason that it fails to be conformal at that point is because f prime of 0 is 0. And so that means that 0 is a singular point. Or f. And I know this is one of these places where the words all bleed into each other, but singular does not mean singularity. It means that something is strange about the way that the function is acting locally. All right. So I keep using the word local. Local is another word that gets thrown around all the time in mathematics. We can make that precise as well. So for us, if I use the word local, so if uh, something happens locally, if uh, it holds in a neighborhood, of each point in the domain. So what I mean by that is, uh, in a picture, when we talked about, even though the way we set this machinery up from the beginning, when we define differentiability, we have to set the differentiability up not in a point-wise fashion in complex analysis, but in a local fashion. So when we talked about what a, when a function is holomorphic, what we meant was that that we can find some little disk around the point z naught where, uh, you know, for example, f is differentiable, complex differentiable, at z naught, really means that it's differentiable at every point in a little disk around that point. So since we built complex analysis from the very beginning to be sort of a local type of mathematics, it shouldn't surprise you that the features that we're studying also hold locally. So that actually ends up to hold true for inverses. This should strike you as pretty strange because it's not definitely not the case that I can just write down a real function and say that real functions are sort of universally locally invertible. Um, if you've seen any sort of, actually, I, did he, how many people have taken the 412 sequence in here? 412, 13, 414. Did you guys talk about the inverse function theorem? <laughs> <laughs> so you okay the one variable version? Did anybody cover it in? Uh, okay, there's a few of you in here that took me for uh, the vector calculus class, and I didn't have time to really do it any justice, so I skipped it. I feel bad about it. Did anybody has anybody seen the inverse function theorem before? You want to take a stab at what it says? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so. The inverse function theorem is a super important theorem that describes when a function has not a global inverse, but a local inverse. So in analysis, it's just too much to ask that our functions are globally invertible. So instead what we do is we're looking for conditions where we can restrict to, well, who cares about the whole function? The entire idea of calculus is that you can pull your vision into a single point and then expand out in some neighborhood and say, well, it doesn't matter what's happening everywhere. Maybe I can find a little disk where things are invertible. And then if I have to work with the whole function, I can just do it over and over and over again all over the place. So it's stitched together in a, like, sort of in, in a way to go back and forth between a function and its inverse. So this is called an inverse function theorem. In complex analysis, it's particularly nice because analytic functions are so structured and so rigid that they have this property. So uh, if we let f map from a into c, where a is a domain, and as before, f prime of z naught is not equal to 0, 
or any z naught in A. So that, you, from its calculus standpoint, you should imagine if we were in R, by asserting that the derivative isn't equal to zero, it means that we're avoiding points where we're at local maxes and local mins, essentially, right? So at least with this model, you might believe, and this is the way we define, the, say, the inverse functions for trig functions, on a model like this, you might believe that if you picked a point over here, that you could find some neighborhood around that point where it's locally one-to-one, -one, right? It's locally a monotonic function. Locally one-to-one -one functions, that's invertible. When you guys define the inverse of the, the sine function, what you do is you draw a sine graph, and then you say, well, throw away all the sine except for this part right here and take the inverse of that and call it arc sine. And the reason that you do that is because that part is invertible. So through domain restriction, you make the inverse function. This is like sort of a beefed up version of that idea. Staying away from any place where the function might have a local maximum or minimum. Uh, um, then there exists a neighborhood Uh, 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 any z naught in A, uh, let's say, call it in the neighborhood U of any z naught in A. Um, did I lose? Did I really print over the top of this? And A. Okay, it's fun. Anyway, the idea here is that. Uh, that there exists a neighborhood U um, uh, of any z naught in A um, and a function f inverse so that one f is bijective. I'll talk about what that means. So one to one and onto oh okay I know what I'm missing here so, so let me let me patch this theorem slightly I'm sorry I, when I printed this I didn't realize I was going to delete the middle line of the theorem so it's the neighborhood of u of z not in a and a neighborhood v of f of z not so the idea in a picture is that I have some set A, and over here I have F of A, so the image of F, whatever it happens to be. What we're going to say is I can find uh, for any z naught that we have, that we pick, if this function is analytic and it's not equal, this derivative isn't zero anywhere, that I can find a neighborhood over here of z naught, so that's the set U, and wherever f of z naught ends up landing, I can find a neighborhood v around that. This is v. So that the map from u to v is bijective. That is, every point here gets sent uniquely to a point here. And every point over here comes uniquely from a point over here. So that one f from u to v is a bijection, which I mean one to one and onto, or if you like, it's also called an invertible map, depending on what language you've seen before. Yep. This holds for all functions and the error would not matter. What's that? This holds for all functions. <laughs> Any analytic function. Sorry, uh, did I not say analytic here? Yeah, I meant to. Did I drop that? Yeah, yeah. F is uh, a analytic. Yeah, I said it in words and I forgot to write it. Yeah, so this does not hold for all kinds of functions. Generally, this is not going to hold. It's the analyticity and the fact that we have this local differentiability that makes this run, that makes this drive. Yep. So you said there's an like this is like the existence of u and v. Is is it strong enough that like given a given any neighborhood u that doesn't include like a f of z not equal to zero uh, in the neighborhood that I can like give you like a corresponding neighborhood v or is it like there exists 
And they threaten you and So it really is about existence because you could have the function fail to be, uh, just because the function fails to be uh, differentiable on some simply connected domain, it could be the case that the function is wrapping the complex plane around itself. And so you, you could end up in the overlap if you made the domain big enough. So the idea is that at some point you could shrink yourself down enough that you, you lose the twisting that's happening. So yeah, it's not a it's not a like you give me a U and I can find a V. It's that it really is a there exists. But there'll be a you know, as is typical of these, there'll be some maximum size of the U that you can do, and then anything inside of it you can specify with the unique neighborhood coming out the other side. But there's another question. Uh, you just made a mistake. It's uh, back in the I have their F analytic on. Thank you. Okay, so first that it's bijective. That should be believable because again, remember that analytic functions are so ridiculously strong. They have these power series, they're infinitely differentiable. The, if you think, remember what the maximum modulus principle says, it's almost like the function is kind of this sheet that only goes in one direction locally. Um, so this shouldn't be that surprising if that holds. Uh, two, and this is nice, f inverse from v to u is analytic. Although I defy you to calculate its, its, uh, its formula if you're just given a power series. And three, and really the, the, the central observation that replicates the result from real calculus, that the derivative with respect to w of f inverse of w is equal to one over the derivative with respect to z of f. So all of this basically says that analytic functions have analytic inverses locally. So if I'm willing to narrow my vision down to single points, on an analytic function, I can do exactly the same trick I did in R. And that same kind of, I mean, these aren't really slopes anymore at this point, but that same sort of reciprocal slope trick where you reflect across the line y equals x, that still works. Now what's useful about this idea is that if this isn't equal to zero, then that also can't be equal to zero. Right? I mean, so, I mean, that should make sense, right? If a function is invertible and it started out with a non-zero derivative and it has this sort of reciprocal slope relationship, it's not going to somehow end up with a vertical tangent plane. So, if you want the, the short version of the inverse function theorem with all, of the, with all of the bladder, it's that analytic functions are locally invertible away from their singular point. Which is a very nice idea. All right, questions about the inverse function here. So I'll write the short version up on the board, and then we'll use it to do something. Okay, so the short version. another justification for calling these things singular points, right? There's a place where the behavior is bad. Okay. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to put some structure on the control maps. Yep? Is it possible to include a singular point as like a point in your domain? So because domains are always open, you can, you're never, I mean, none of, all of this falls apart if you work on closed domains. And so that's going to be an issue when we start talking about what happens at the boundary of analytic functions, right? So the, the big thing to keep in mind here is that, yeah, the natural way to work in analytic functions is that domains are open connected sets. And actually, it's a good question when you can glue the boundary onto. So I, I, this is going to be a long running question in here related to this idea. When does an analytic function on 
on an open domain, you extend. We can't hope for analyticity at the boundary because the analyticity is about disks, right? But we could at least hope that the function, I could just plug numbers in and limits would, would hold. If it looks like I'm headed somewhere in the interior and I get to the edge, I would like it to be the case that the limit of where the function looks like it's going is where it's going. So does u extend uh, to, uh, does f um, extend to a uh, continuous function? On, okay, I'm going to use a topological symbol here. Don't get scared. The closure of u. That's not the complex conjugate of u. This is the closure of u, which you can also just imagine is u and its boundary. If you like, if you have a set u, then the boundary of u, uh, so you union that up with this set. There's no interior here. U is this set, which is an open domain. Its boundary set, boundary of U, is just the contour that runs around the outside of it. This is the boundary of U. And the idea is, just because you're analytic in here does not necessarily mean that as you're moving along inside here, that what you reach when you hit the edge is what you should reach. And that's what it would mean by continuity. And this, is, this seems like it should work every time, but it absolutely doesn't, which is why complex analysis is hard. All right, good question. OK, so one of the uses of the inverse function theorem is to say that conformal maps, when you start chaining them together in various ways, stay conformal, which is a useful idea. So the first thing is, um, if, oh, let me remind you again, I'll put this on the board for those of you that haven't seen this terminology. Bijective means one to one and onto, and really it means that there's just a unique correspondence between every set in the domain and every set in the range that you can always get back and forth. You can pick here and figure out what was over here. You can pick here and figure out where it came from over here. But this is unique. The other word is invertible. Okay. So here's a proposition. It's going to be two of these structural propositions. If f taking uh, a to b is conformal and bijective, <clears throat> then f inverse taking B to A is conformal and bijective. Now conformal and bijective together, that's a, that's a lot of like stuff to impose on a function. Not only is the function invertible, but also it preserves angles. Yep? That's embedded in the definition of conformal. So I thought, let me yeah. So that's another good thing to remember here. Is that part of the definition of conformal was that the derivative is non-zero. So um, conformal, you can think of as includes f prime of z. Conformal on a set A means f prime of z naught is not equal to zero for any z naught. So it's sort of an algebraic, sort of like, you know, math by definition kind of thing, where you're just like, oh, well, I'll just take this property and make it a definition, but it works. So yeah, it's intrinsic to say, I, if I say conformal, it must be the case that, because, uh, um, you know, I guess the idea here is we don't want to include, it may be the case that a map preserves angles at a point where its derivative is zero, but I don't want to consider that class of functions in any domain including that, because it's, it's not guaranteed. So it's better just to say, we're going to state conformal means conformal on every point inside of a domain. Yeah. So conformal just means analytic and that, and that's yeah. it? Okay. That's all it means. OK, so 
the conformality and uh, bijectivity. Well, the bijectivity is it's pretty obvious that if f is bijective, then its inverse is bijective, right? Because if there's a unique correspondence between domain elements and range elements, then you can reverse the function, and these are the domain elements and these are the range elements, but all you've done is flip the direction of the arrows, right? So if you're bijective in one direction, you're bijective in the other direction. The conformality of the inverse is a consequence of the uh, inverse function theorem. Because what does it mean to be conformal? It means that your derivative is non-zero. So here we go. I'm going to do a, an absolutely stupid proof. I'm going to prove this proposition. So what do we know? We know f is bijective. Uh, maybe I'll even write proof right here. These will get more interesting. F is by Jack, but I mean, there's something important about like tracing the way that these properties are inherited by like manipulating these functions. F is bijective, so F inverse exists and is bijective. So all you're doing is flipping the arrows on the relation. F is conformal. So f prime at z naught is not equal to 0 for any z naught in its domain A. The inverse function theorem says, so by the inverse function theorem, <coughs> the derivative of f inverse is 1 over f prime of z. But if that's never equal to 0, then 1 over it can never be equal to 0. So therefore, this derivative is never equal to 0. Because f prime of z is not equal to 0 on a, then 1 over f prime of z is not equal to 0 on a. So d by dw of f inverse of w is not equal to 0. Yep. Do we need to use conformality of f to show that that's true? Well, no, this is a, so this is just a, this is definitional, right? f being conformal. F being so the the bijectivity gets us the inverse exists. Right. It's the it's the analyticity that's running around in the background gets us the inverse function theorem. Right. And the inverse function theorem is so, so conformal. Uh, so analytic and conformal uh, analytic functions with non-zero derivatives are conformal functions. So conformal is sort of carrying analyticity along with it. Okay. Right. And so it's like, if you think about conformality is carrying two pieces of information: analytic and non-zero derivative. The not, and the analyticity was used here in asserting that the inverse function theory held, the function Sorry. theorem held. Okay. And the non-zero derivative, it shows that this reciprocal can never be zero. And that means that the inverse can never have a zero derivative. So I guess my question is, isn't this just like a double true for any bijective analytic function? That is, with a, you need the non-zero derivative condition, though. So bijective analytic function is not necessarily uh, going to be a function with, uh, uh, because you can have places like this. You can still sort of have this real calculus sort of thing where you come in and have a flat derivative, but then you peel off in a different direction. Right. I, that, that makes sense geometrically. I guess I don't see where you're using f prime is equal to zero in the proof. So well, this is where I, OK. Do you agree with me that this holds? Yes. OK. And you agree with me that that best quantity down here, that is f prime of z, right? Yes. Can I that mean, be equal to 0? No. So could 1 over it be equal to 0? But like 1, it's going to sound stupid, but 1 over 0 is like infinity. Yeah. So if f prime is 0. So when, so when, we're, doing, when we're doing the sort of like thing where we're studying these functions, mm -hmm. 
you, we're not working on the extended complex plane here. We're not, we're not working on the Riemann sphere. So infinity is not a value that we're allowed to, uh, that we're allowed to attain in a, in, a, in a derivative. Essentially, that would correspond to having a pole. And right. having a pole would mean, that, because it means that you're like this, right? And having a pole is going to mean that the function is not going to have the analytic behavior that you're looking for. Yeah? Two things. Uh, one, this has to be not equal to zero, not equal to zero. Yeah. And then two, I think that what he's trying to say is that I don't care if f prime of z can be equal to zero. If I know that f inverse of w is one over it, it, it also can't be equal to zero. Ever. Uh, but I think that the reason that that, that matters isn't, like, it's because we're invoking the inverse function theorem, right? So yeah, I mean, intrinsically, this is, I mean, the, the fact that this relationship, I mean, if you didn't know that the function was conformal, then you would not necessarily know, uh, so like, one over, let's so like z squared, for example. I mean, yes, there's, all of this stuff is basically secretly equivalent, right? It's like, which is, that's really what's going on here is we're constructing the equivalences and pulling them out. Like, we give them names because these properties were discovered independently and they're different ideas. And it's sort of one of these magical things where complex analytic functions are so structured that analytic plus something turns out to be equivalent to these really strong geometric conditions. Like, if I didn't know that this was not zero, then I don't know anything. I mean, you can invoke this without knowing anything about the way f is acting. This theorem still holds, like, regardless of, um, uh, oh, okay, okay, now I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, no, 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 I, I absolutely understand what you're saying now. Okay, so what you're saying is if you even invoke the inverse function theorem, then it was secretly the case that the map running around in the background was conformal. Because you could never have attained you could have never had this derivative be equal to um, yeah. uh, infinity, right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. The, the, the implication is just in the wrong direction there. You're right. It's 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 not. You are correct, but this is the reason why it's correct. This is secretly what's running around in the background. Is this is all conformal? So you get conformal by just following the plane. Essentially, yeah. I mean, analytic functions are conformal maps. Right? That's like, as long as you're not in places, the only place they're going to be conformal is in places where their derivatives aren't zero. This is just revealing that fact. Oh, okay, so what you're saying is all analytic functions are conformal. Yeah, actually, yes. It's local, except for an isolated number of right, points. Right, sure. Okay. I guess that makes me feel better. Yeah. And this is kind of what we're trying to build is like the fact that analytic functions are all intrinsically conformal, right? I mean, okay. we're revealing the fact that the family of analytic functions, except for a few places where they happen to peak, are conformal everywhere. Got it, okay. Right. Okay. So that's, is that okay? Okay. <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, right, so, after all that discussion, what I want you to know here is the following. That if you start with a conformal bijective function and you invert it, you remain a conformal bijective function. This is important to pull, this is why this is a proposition, not a theorem, right? This, but this is still important to pull out because it means if you're working with conformal maps in practice, in practice, one of the things that we do with conformal maps is we have some function f defined on a domain. And that function sucks, right? So maybe f, uh, uh, f is a function, and it's on some terrible domain, and it maps into C, and we want to study F. But the domain of F and the boundary of F are so terrible that I can't say anything about it. So what I do is I impose another map into the picture. So you can call this, like, I don't know, about C for conformal. We set up a conformal equivalence that makes this set nice. And then we solve C composed with F. We work with that function instead because now we've got a function. It preserves all the geometry of F that was happening here because it preserves all the angles that are happening. It preserves everything about trajectories and paths that are going through here because if we have some local property and we look at a path through that point and we look at its tangent line, well, over here, because this was a conformal map, yeah, the curve might get distorted in some way, but the tangent line is distorted in a predictable way. I can solve a problem involving the function c composed with f. I guess f composed with c, right? So you do c first, and then you do f. If this is a nice function, it has all the geometry of the original domain built into it, and then when you're done, you can undo it because if you go in the inverse direction, you're still conformal. 
So undoing the geometric manipulations is like you just basically unrotate. In linear algebra, this is equivalent to diagonalizing a matrix, working with the diagonal matrix in the middle, and then gluing the change of basis matrices back in when you're finished. Okay, is that all right? Okay. Okay, I'm not. I'll let you guys prove the next one. There's the next proposition about conformal maps. So here's proposition number two for the day. If F from A to B is conformal and bijective, I'm going to introduce a word for conformal and bijective in a second. And G taking B to C is conformal and bijective. Then it should not surprise you to discover that G composed with F is conformal and bijective. Okay. Why? Yeah, one line proof. Yep. Um, so for the bijectivity, you can just compose the inverses. Yeah, composition of bijections or bijections. If you're unique and unique, you just flip the arrows around the other way. Okay. And then for the uh, the conformality, uh, you can just note that neither of these functions can extend uh, a derivative. No, that's right. You got one more line to go. One idea from calculus one. Neither one of them can send anything to zero, then you just use the chain rule, right? Oh, right? You can take a chain rule of a composition, you get two derivatives, neither one of them can be zero, and so therefore the composition can't have a zero derivative. Right? So I'll leave this, even though we did it out loud, proof left to reader. No cheating. It's worth taking the time to, I mean, this is like a two-liner, but if you're interested in how these sort of like structural proofs work, um, uh, it's not a difficult one, not required at all. Okay, so those of you that have any, that know anything about algebra, should like your nose should be twitching now, because I'm saying that the set of conformal bijective maps, say bijective and conformal under inverses, and if I'm conformal and bijective, I can compose and remain conformal mm -hmm. and bijective, and that smells a lot like group structure to me. That I can invert and that I can multiply if I let multiplication be composition. So for those of you that don't know what a group is, uh, that is an important idea even in engineering and applied mathematics because it says something about how functions close up as families, how they're preserved under operations. So the only problem, problem is the way that this composition is set up, I might be changing the domain of the functions. And so I might leave, if I say, oh, I want the set of all conformal bijective maps that take A to B, well, I can't compose those with each other because if I go from A to B, I can't compose that with another function that goes from A to B. The domains don't match. So I'm going to introduce a special family of functions called the automorphisms. So let, and that's not the automorphisms of higher modern algebra. These are We are function theorists in here. These are just functions. These are fancy names because I'm tired of writing conformal and bijective. So let A be a domain in C. So an automorphism of A. I'm going to replace having to write bijective with automorphism instead. An, automorph an automorphism of A um, is a bijection, or a bijective map from A to itself. So the idea here is F takes A to itself and invertible. So an automorphism is just you feed it a set. It basically relabels everything in the set as a different thing in the set. I can see all of you who are scarred from algebra in here, like, oh, no, this is going to get bad. But when you're working with uh, function, when you're working with function theory, it's nice to know which operations keep the structure like preserved when you're working with functions. 
Okay, so um, here's a theorem. A set of conformal automorphisms on A is a group. I'll remind everybody what a group is in that student. Where the group operation is a composition of functions. And if you guys have seen algebra in any depth, you've probably talked about automorphism groups. So it's this is sort of the one of the places where complex analysis butts up against a, a huge piece of other research areas, right? Because as soon as I have a family of functions that has a group structure, it means that I can study them with calculus or I can study them with algebra. Yep. Sorry, what does that third mind say group operation is? Uh, composition of functions. Okay. Sorry, I'll write that more clearly. Okay. If you don't know what a group is, so a group is a collection of elements, you can think a set, with an identity element um, everything has an inverse. And uh, it's closed under whatever the group operation is. So closed under multiplication. I am not being very precise about this, but this is for those of you that haven't seen groups before. You think a set where I can mash the elements together by inverting or, or multiplying, and I stay inside the set. And there's a huge theory of groups that you can use that you can bring to bear on. Uh, on these structures algebraically, but since we're talking about conformal automorphisms, it means we can use complex analysis on them as well. And one of the sort of big early like uh, joinings of mathematics were when people figured this out, and you actually a lot of algebra began as the study of complex functions. Because you start with this specific body of things that you can understand, and then you take a perspective and you step back and say, well, why did we have to deal with complex functions? Let's just let them be elements instead. Okay, so in the, the, the problem with this is that's like super vague. I mean, A could be any domain, and I've got this magic family of functions that's the conformal bijections or the conformal automorphisms on that domain that doesn't tell me what they are or how they act. And so one of the next things we're going to do after we're out of this initial introduction to conformality is we're going to talk about a, a magical family of conformal automorphisms by letting A be equal to the unit disk. So next chapter, section, whatever, I don't know what I'm calling these, next section, we're going to talk about these automorphisms. <coughs> And it's going to turn out that the reason that you want to do that is that they all have a very similar structure to each other. Every function in this family is a degree one rational function, it turns out. That's for the future. This is sometimes called the study of the Mobius group. I've seen this before. But I can't talk about this until we do the Riemann sphere. So like lurking in the background are sort of more esoteric ideas. Yep. Is the operation of composition in saying that all the elements are degree one rational functions? How would you compose them to get out a how, how do you compose them to get out so a degree one rational function? <laughs> well, I invite you uh, I, I invite you to do the calculation. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bunch of rational function theory. If you think about what it is that happens, you're gonna end up with 
There's a Z, one Z in the top and one Z in the bottom. So you put a fraction that has Z's in the top and bottom in there. When you clear denominators, the Z's that were in the top of both fractions stay where they were. The constant terms inherit the Z's that were in the denominators, but now you've the degree one polynomial on top and degree one polynomial on bottom, so you don't actually raise the degree because you're never multiplying polynomials. You're just clearing denominators. You, it's eight, just, you should write it down and look at it. It's actually not so hard to believe that if you compose degree one rational functions that you stay degree one. What if it's like say z? That's perfectly legit. What do you get when you compose z with itself? That's not multiplication, right? Yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay. okay. Um, what we're going to do before we get into this about uh, choosing specific domain and looking at the functions that act on it is we're going to, uh, I'm going to, the next time what we'll do is we'll talk about a really, really useful function that drives a huge amount of the way that uh, uh, actually the sort of invention of fluid flow on the plane was, uh, was talked about originally. Um, and uh, from a theoretical perspective, a way of never working with bad functions, but only with good ones. And that's the idea of uh, working with what are called conformally equivalent sets. So if I start with a domain and I map to another domain, those sets are said to be conformally equivalent. If I can find a conformal bijection between A and B, if F is a conformal bijection, then we say A and B are conformally equivalent because I can go back and forth and the geometry is preserved. And there's this ridiculous theorem that says that if this set is simply connected, well, the, the theorem says is every simply connected set is conformally equivalent to every other simply connected set. You said that you just have to find the transform. What's that? You just have to find the transform. That's the problem. Finding the transform, this is an existence theorem, and so we're going to talk about when you can actually do it. Right? So yeah, so we're going to use conformal equivalence to start investigating how we can change domains into other domains and, and what actually happens to the boundary when we do that. All right. Thanks, guys. I will post some stuff for you uh, sometime today. And uh...